Hello, everyone. Let's stand up and worship our God. Good morning, Valley Harvest. We have a few technical difficulties, but we'll get them sorted out. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you know how to get these wildfires to stop. You can send the right weather, you can send rain, 
you can dial down the winds. You did that many times, Lord, and we read that in scriptures as well. And so we pray in Jesus' name that you get these wildfires under control so that our kids, uh, they're going to have camp today and the rest of the week, and uh, they can have a good time, and the air quality be good, and for us here in town as well. I also pray for all those people that lost their homes right now. Lord, it's devastating. And they're hurt, and I pray that you be with them. Uh, help them understand uh, you're, in, you're in control. Have them faith um, in you. I pray that you bless the service as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The next time we will sing it will be Jesus, thank you. If you want to find words on your phones, <laughs> maybe it will be better. The 
Drink the bitter cup reserved for me. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. The next song will be always forgiven, but there is no words. Amen. 
One more time, thank you for joining us. So uh, for those who have translation devices, be patient with them. They're working on getting those fixed if we can. Um, if you have the online app through your phone, that's working right now. Эта часть работает, можно через нее, хорошо? All right, so that's good. So, um, we have a new member. We want to invite Yuri. Yuri, come up, please. Подходи. So, we want to introduce Yuri. Uh, Yuri, как фамилия? Harbor. Harbor, okay. So, welcome him. Uh, let's, let's pray really quick and welcome him in. And we'll continue with the announcements. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for Yuri that he decided to come and join our church and be a member, a member of you, your church and ours. Uh, we pray that you bless him here and you give him wisdom so he can be fruitful here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so as you guys know, uh, we're planning to have family, not family, kids camp. Uh, that's later on today, so moms and dads, if you're worried about the air quality, do talk to Anton. 
they're going to be very cautious on that. And if things get worse and, you know, worsens, then they'll take according actions, all right? So uh, Anton is here. So do talk to him about that if you are worried, all right? We'll do our best to protect our kids, maybe limit the activities outside. There will be AC in the main building and AC in the cabin, so um, that'll clean out the air a little bit. And it's less smoky up there as far as I know, okay? So we were out in spirit uh, these couple of days, and it's just a little bit south from there, and it's, it's better than Spokane. I'll tell you that. And Anton went up there and looked as well. Okay? So youth Fridays as usual. Uh, that's at 7 o'clock. Now, one important announcement we have. We have uh, coming up in September, the first Sunday, so that'll be the third, we're going to be switching to one service. All right? So if you guys know uh, any of your friends that attend the Russian service, we will be switching that to the 1230 English. So we'll be forwarding with one service after that, okay? I think that's, um, I think I explained that well. I don't know, okay? So let them know, and we'll announce that during Russian as well, and that'll be here in a couple of weeks. Now, we have an opportunity to serve here at church. As you guys know, we have a property, and there's a couple trees, actually six trees that need to be cut down. Uh, there was some mention on that on some of the groups that we have on uh, Viber and things like that. So we need men, men with chainsaws, men with strength, and the willpower. So Friday, uh, that's going to be the 9th, September 9th, and Saturday, if you can volunteer I know there's a couple of people that signed up, but we need more help. So uh, Artom Jelis is in charge of that. He's running the show there. Uh, we have a contractor that's going to do the main work, but we will need to clean up the rest. Okay, so that's two days. So please let them know, um, and uh, there'll be some food. There'll be some people prepping for that as well. Okay, so you're not just alone there, just slaving away. Okay. Uh, next thing we have is we have the offering and tithes, the little box. If you have something to put in there, we're grateful for that. Do that. And that's about all the announcements I have for today. Pastor Alex will come and, come and preach. Thank you. Good afternoon, wonderful people. I see you smiling, so it looks like smoke doesn't bother you. That's good. Um, is this working? Is it working? One, 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 two, three. Okay, it works. So, <clears throat> again, I want to remind you to pray about a, a kids' camp that's starting today. Uh, there's a lot of concern about air quality and of course kids like to play outside you know with the uh, i'm sure there are a lot of activities scheduled for that so we want to have a, a good air and uh, as a uh, people there is nothing we can do about it we can't send the rain on fires we can't send the wind so it blows away the smoke <laughs> to somebody else <laughs> to our neighbors uh, but uh, we can pray to god if we're believers we should have faith and pray to God about the situation. And coincidentally, I'm going to speak in about faith today, about lessons of faith that we can learn from the Scripture. My story today is in the book of Mark. Book of Mark, verses uh, 5 through 42. Actually, no. Book of Mark, chapter 5, verses 22 through 42. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and on seeing him, Jesus, fell at his feet and implored him earnestly saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and leave. And he went off with him and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. A woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hand of many physicians and had spent all that she had 
and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. Immediately, the flow of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official saying, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid any longer, only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the synagogue official, and he saw a commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing. And entering in, he said to them, Why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died but is asleep. They began laughing at him. But putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child was. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old, and immediately they were completely astounded. So this is our story today, and as I said, we're going to look specifically in this story at the issue of faith. We're going to look at three things in this story. First of all is the power of faith. The second point is going to be a trial of faith. And the third point is going to be the object of faith. So talking about the power of faith, we can see that the faith can work in people without discrimination regarding their society status. We see in this story that these two people, the woman, we don't know her name, and synagogue official by the name of Jairus, they were at the opposite ends of a society in that town. By the way, that town name is Capernaum. That's where Jesus was um, basing his ministry from. Uh, Jairus well, was, I don't know if he was wealthy or not, but he was well off. Uh, and the woman was absolutely poor. It says here that she spent all the money on the physicians, on doctors, and didn't get any help from them. He was well known because he was synagogue official and she was not well known. She was in hiding because of her um, disease and disease rendered her unclean before the law. And Jairus, of course, he was before the law, he was clean. And I'm, I'm talking about cleanness, like ceremonial cleanness uh, before a, a Jewish law. If you look at the woman, for example, it was not like her whole clothes was stained in blood and, and dirt and filthy. I'm sure she was taking care of her soul hygiene-wise, but uncleanness meant that she had a consistent issue of blood. She had a bleeding in her body. It doesn't say here internal or external, but whatever it was, According to the law, you, you can read uh, in the chapter 15 of the book of Leviticus, this specific situation is addressed in that chapter. Very interesting, and I would advise you to, to look at that and see how difficult the life was for that woman because that law renders person unclean if there is any issue of body fluids 
in him, external or internal. That means he becomes unclean, and not only his status is unclean, he has to take action. He has to wash his clothes. She had to wash her clothes every day, and she was rendering, even after the washing clothes, she was rendering unclean until the evening. More than that, more than that, everything she touched was unclean. Every article of furniture, every article of dishes in the kitchen, every person, every uh, garment on other person would become unclean. More than that, any other person who would sit on the same bench with her would become unclean. Any person that would touch the spoon or fork or plate that she touched would become unclean. And he had to wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. And then in the morning, that person is clean again, providing there is no more issue of body fluids in him. This woman had a consistent bleeding. That means there was absolutely no time in her life where she was considered clean. She was constantly unclean and forced into the hiding from society. This person, the Jairus, for example, he was a leader of a spiritual life in this city where this woman could not participate in anything in this city, not go to synagogue, not to go on any celebration, not to go on any public gathering, nowhere she couldn't go. Such a different people. He was brave. He came to Jesus openly and she was afraid. She was hiding in the crowd. He was speaking to Jesus openly with his mouth, and she was speaking to herself because she was hiding. The only thing that united them was a life tragedy and faith. Life tragedy and faith. They both had sickness in their family. Jairus had a daughter that was dying, and woman, of course, had a disease of bleeding the blood constantly. And that was that what, what, what united them. And this problem drove these people, this tragedy drove these people to Jesus Christ. Why? Because they had faith that Christ and only Christ can help them in this problem. And I think this situation reflects the uh, situation of our time where we live. No matter what part of society you are, if you're well-known, if you're famous, if you're rich, or maybe you're poor, sick, and not know but anybody, the Christians around the world can fit in any portion of a society, in any portion of society. And again, any person, doesn't matter what part of society you are in, you can be subject to a life tragedy. If you're wealthy, if you're famous, you can get sick. And if you are poor and not known and neglected and rejected by society, you can also have a tragedy. And believers in this world are united not in the social status. They are united in faith, just like these two people were united, united in faith. So that's the power of faith. It is available to anyone who wants to believe. Anyone who understands that this tragedy that he has, whatever it is, physical, and more importantly, spiritual predicament that people have, the sin that permeates a human being from his birth. If you understand that, you will understand that the only person that can help you is Jesus Christ. And your faith will drive you to Jesus Christ. And this is a good news. The second point we want to touch on is a trial of faith, a trial of faith. We see over here in this, in this story that faith doesn't mean that your life gets very easy. Oh, Jesus is here. He can help. Now I have no problem. It's very easy sailing from this point on. No, it's not. We can see that these people, Jairus and this woman, they went to, through certain trials uh, in their faith. For example... If we look at Jairus, he had to overcome a tremendous pressure from a surrounding society. He was a synagogue official, and we know that synagogue officials, they were leaders of society. They were Pharisees, 
scribes, uh, law teachers, and they didn't like Jesus. Synagogue officials didn't like, like Jesus. And whenever he would come to synagogue and preach, something would almost always happen that would irritate synagogue officials. Either it was a healing uh, of somebody that Jesus did on the Sabbath or maybe some conversation, some religious theological argument that they would lose publicly arguing with Jesus and get upset. But synagogue officials did not like Jesus. And it, it, I'm talking about at the beginning of Christ's ministry. As his ministry progressed, this dislike of Jesus Christ among officials and leaders of Jewish nation, it grew more and more and more to the point that by the end of Christ's ministry, it was a hatred. It was absolute burning hatred toward Jesus Christ. So this guy, Jairus, he's a synagogue official. And he has this pressure from his co-ministers that don't like Jesus, but he decides to go against the grain, against the consensus of his you know, uh, uh, society uh, circle against all that publicly in front of everybody, and he decides to go in and fall at the feet of Jesus Christ and confess verbally, loudly his faith. If you lay your hands on her, she will get well and will live. What a faith. What a faith. And he's not worried about condemnation that will surely come from his friends and co-ministers, other synagogue officials. And that is a trial of faith. That is a trial of faith. Same thing about woman. She understands that she is rejected and she cannot enter the crowd. It's not that she's infected and if, like leprosy, if she goes into crowd, everybody gets sick. No, she is enormous inconvenience to the crowd, and the crowd knows that. If she goes in the crowd and touches anybody, that person has to get, go out and wash his clothes and sit home until the evening, and nobody wants to do it. Nobody wants to do it. So she has to hide. She has to risk she has to put on new clothes that nobody knows that it's her. Maybe cover her face a little bit and just go through the crowd, you know, rub the shoulders with a bunch of people that if they found out she, who she is, they will be very upset and very hostile towards her. But she does it anyway because she wants to get healing. She wants to get to Jesus and she wants to touch her, his uh, clothes. And she is also expressing her faith. Maybe not out loud or in front of anybody, but in herself. She's speaking in herself, inside herself, and telling herself, if I just touch his garments, I will be healed. What a tremendous faith that goes through the trials of external pressure. The same thing in our day. If you are a believer today, you have to understand that your faith will be tried. It doesn't matter what part of society you're in. If you're up top like Jairus or down low like this woman, your faith will be tested. If you're well-known and have a white-collar job and work somewhere in the bank or government agency, you are at risk of being ridiculed for being a Christian. Not only ridiculed, if you start expressing your faith just like Jairus did, you are risking to lose your position. You can be fired and most likely will be fired today from the job if you witness to somebody about Christ and about gospel. If you uh, start talking about righteousness of God and sinfulness of man, starting condemning practices of, of current society, sexual immorality and violence that is uh, normalized today in society, you will be fired from your job, from your position, no matter how high you are. It takes a lot of risk, a lot of courage, a lot of bravery to keep your faith, exercise your faith without fear of losing your position in society. And the same thing if you're down low, if you're prosecuted, if you're rejected and you start expressing your faith, you can get more problems in your life. You can get arrested, thrown to jail, depending on where, where you live, and uh, lose not only your position, uh, your income, but lose your life, lose your freedom. 
this fly likes me for some reason. Um, so <clears throat> we can see that this is a good example for us to uh, exercise our faith, to um, expect trials, and to be victorious in these trials. But these trials do not end here. We can see further down, further down the road as this story progresses, more trials come to these people, to Jairus and to this woman. For Jairus, the bad news comes. Bad news comes because while he is walking and has his hopes up that finally Christ is coming to my house and everything should be okay once he arrives there, you know, his people come from his cow house and say, not only inform him about the death of his daughter, but they also uh, point out to the fact that you shouldn't worry and trouble the teacher, Jesus Christ, because actually he can't help you now. You know, you know I mean, it, it's interesting how these people, you know, present their, their, their uh, the information to Jairus. Uh, one thing for him, for them would be to come and say, hey, your daughter has died. We don't know what to say. But totally different thing is to come and say, hey, your daughter has died, so Christ can do nothing here. Just let him go. Totally different. And I think this is the moment where his faith takes a direct hit from people who are nearby who are bringing down on him enormous doubt. And we know that doubt destroys the faith. The Bible says so. So this um, Jairus right now is in fear. That's why Jesus said, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Why? Because the doubt, the destruction of faith brings tremendous fear in the person's life. And so today, the same thing. You know, people try to destroy faith of believers. Sometimes intentionally, sometimes not intentionally. They bring their ironclad human logic. Hey, you should be wise men. Look at the situation. Don't you see? There is nothing you can do. There is nothing God can do. There is nothing Jesus can do here. What are you hoping for? Sometimes they bring, you know, scientific discoveries, facts, arguments, whatever they can to destroy your faith. And fear, if you give in to this attack from outside, sometimes from people who are close to you, this fear will set in. This doubt will start destroying your faith. Just like those waves. Remember when Peter was walking on the water, listening to Jesus, watching him, and then he looked at the waves and like, those are huge waves, and boom, immediately start sinking. Same thing here. This uh, attack could destroy faith of Jairus and our faith also if we give in to the fear. A woman, the same thing. She has a trouble coming her way also. She touched the garment. She got healed. Looks like, well, the thing is done. All I have to do is just, you know, go home and rejoice. No, no. The trouble is coming from none other but Christ himself. He's like, hey, wait, wait, hold on, hold on the crowd. Who touched me? And she's like, oops, does, does, does he know? And immediately she starts fearing. She has a fear in her and trembling. Wow, what did I do? He looks upset. Did I steal? Looks like I stole something. Well, it does look like I stole something from him. I mean, I didn't ask for permission. I just came in, just took it without, you know, telling him anything. What's going to happen? He's, gonna be, uh, he's going to reveal me in front of everybody, put in front of everybody, tell everybody what I did. And, 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 and the crowd, they're going to be so mad because I'm unclean. And Jairus, Jairus is going to be real upset because I'm holding up Jesus. He needs to hurry to, to his daughter, you know, and I'm holding him up. I mean, all these things, all these thoughts might have been going through her mind. And the biggest concern, I think, was will Jesus take this healing away? Because I stole. I stole from him. Well, if we look at the story, how it goes further down, we can see that uh, obvious uh, goal of Jesus Christ was not to uh, put this woman down, to rebuke her, to um, take away what she got from him, but uh, his desire was to reveal her faith to other people. 
He didn't like the fact that she was hiding the faith. He wanted her to show her faith to other people. It is very important. Why? So other people can be encouraged, especially Jairus. Jairus right now is in fear. The news came, the daughter is dead. And people are saying Christ can do anything about it. And the testimony of this woman would be very, very help helpful for Jairus. So Christ stops the crowd and he calls her out and say, hey, you need to share your faith. You need to share the miracle that you experienced. You need to share the healing that you experienced because your faith is an encouragement for people around you, especially encouragement to Jairus. And so is in our life. Many Christians, sadly today, are very happy to be saved, are very happy to be free in Christ, but not very eager to show this faith to other people, not very eager and now don't have much desire to share their faith with other people. Why? Because, I mean, it's inconvenient, it's stressful, it's dangerous, as we spoke, spoke a little bit before. So a lot of believers are hiding today and not saying anything to other people about their faith. And Christ says, I don't like it. It's a good thing that you have faith. It is a good thing that you are free. It is a good thing that you are healed. What's bad is that you're hiding that. You shouldn't do that. You should come out and speak about it openly, not be afraid, and share that with other people around you for two reasons. Number one, first reason is so unbelievers can see what faith can do to a sinner. It's a gospel to unbelievers. And to the believers, number two, is encouragement and edification in their trials. Somebody right next to you in your church might be going through a difficult time, and if you share what Christ did in your life, it might and it will help these people. And it reminds me the story of a demon-possessed man that was healed by Jesus Christ, and he liked it so much he wanted to follow Christ. He said, I'm going to follow you, Lord. I'm going to become your disciple. And Christ said, no, no, you go back to your home, you go back to your hometown and tell everybody what God has done in your life. That is the attitude of Jesus Christ, and this should be attitude for every believer in uh, uh, Christianity today. <clears throat> and the third point I want to make is the object of faith. What kind of faith drove these two people? Did they believe in their own faith? Did they believe and had faith in the positive thinking? Did they believe in the special uh, spell, special phrase that they will repeat and that will get them help? You know, a lot of people today, uh, even in Christianity, sometimes... Uh, draw this focus away from Christ as an object of our faith to our faith. And they said, well, see, Christ said, your faith has made you well. So you have to have faith. You have to repeat in yourself, I believe, I will receive, I claim, and all these sort of things. Put the picture in the refrigerator and believe that you're going to get that. And, and draw the focus, try to draw the fo focus from object of real object of faith of Christ into my own positivity, into my own attitude that I'm encouraged, that I'm strong uh, in my faith. And sometimes people start worship, not Christ, but their own faith. My faith is strong enough. And if I believe and if I say, and if I do, I mean, that, then I'll get what I want and what I, what I ask of Christ. No, no, no. Uh, it's more important to believe that the object of our faith is Jesus Christ. If there were no Jesus Christ in that situation, no matter how much Jairus would believe that his daughter can get healed, she wouldn't. No matter how much this woman would believe that she will get healed, if there's no Christ there, she wouldn't get healed. Very important to understand, the object of our faith is Jesus Christ, none other, not our attitudes, not our beliefs, um, not our intentions, not our words that we think are very powerful. They're not. 
they are not. If there is no Christ, our word has no power at all. So, this object of our faith, Jesus Christ, in this story we can see that he is available to anybody. He is available to anybody. He makes him avail himself available to anybody. We can see that he is, uh, he is going with the crowd. And we can see how diverse this crowd is. We don't know, I mean, who else was there. We just know that there was Jairus at the top of a societal ladder. And there was a woman that was down low in society. And I think everybody in the crowd would fit somewhere in between. And everybody had an access to Jesus Christ. Everybody. Anybody could have whatever these two people had if they had faith. Jesus Christ, Apostle Paul talks about when he was preaching to a, um, uh, people in uh, Athens on his missionary trip. He said a very interesting phrase, Acts 17.27. He says this, that they would seek God, and he speaks about people living in this world and God's intention, that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him, meaning touch him physically, and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. You see this phrase? He is not far from whom? From each one of us. Any human being on this earth, wherever you are, at the top or at the bottom, somewhere in the middle, geographically, whether you in China or maybe in Canada or Argentina, it doesn't matter where you are, he is not far, Christ is not far from any one of us. The only thing he is looking for is to seek. So you would seek Christ. So you would seek him, and he makes everything on his part to be near you. It is not hard. It is very easy. The only thing you need to do is to seek. He is available to anybody. The second thing we learn from this story about Jesus Christ, the object of our faith, is that his priority, his priority is the salvation of men. That's his priority. He wants to save people. He is ready. He is ready to stop from what, whatever he's doing, from wherever he's going, he is ready to stop and hear the person, understand the person, and help the person. He was walking to Jairus' house, and he could have thought, you know, you, I don't have time to deal with this woman. She got healed, so be it. I have to hurry because this, this daughter is, is dying. I don't, I don't want to be late. No. First of all, he can't be late. As we see from the story, Christ can never be late. We see the story of Lazarus, you know. Do you remember? When Lazarus died and, and, and Martha came to Jesus and said, well, if he were here, he wouldn't die. Meaning, you're late, Christ. No, Christ is never late. If he goes and, and see, he sees the need, he will stop doing whatever he's doing and he will attend to this need. Remember the story of a Samaritan, good Samaritan, that Christ himself said. What was the problem of all these people that passed by this person that was suffering on the side of the road. What was the problem? They were in a hurry. They were in a hurry. They didn't want to stop by. They didn't want to, you know, break their schedule for the sake of this guy. They had plans and they had to be somewhere at a certain time and they didn't want to break their plans. Christ is not like that. He's not like that. His priority is the salvation of man. And for that, he will stop at anything. He won't stop at anything. He will stop and listen and help just like that good Samaritan. Number three about object of our faith, Jesus Christ, we learn from this story that he is kind. He is kind and understanding to human weakness. What do I mean by that? <clears throat> Notice how people differently perceive the way that Christ should help them. I mean, Jairus and this woman, they both have faith that Christ can help them. But they come to Jesus Christ with their own plan how to do it. Jairus says, Jesus, you need to come down to my house and lay the hands on my daughter. And then she will be healed. 
A woman has a different plan. She is not asking for Christ to come to her house and lay hands on her. She says, nope, I'll just come in, touch the side of his garment, and then I'll be healed. We can see other stories in the Bible. Uh, the, the centurion comes to Jesus and says, hey, my servant is, is sick. Can you help me? Can you heal him? Christ says, okay, I'll come over to your place and, and heal him. And the centurion says, you don't have to. You just say the word and he will be healed. So every person who has a faith might have a different plan for Christ how to do it. And look what Jesus does. He's not talking to people down and say, you know what? Who are you to tell me what to do? I know better what to do. I am God and you're man. I appreciate the fact that you have faith, but how to do it, I will decide. He doesn't do it. He doesn't get uptight, you know, about that. He's not, well, it's human weakness, whatever people um, perceive of me. I mean, if, he, if they want me to come, I'll come. If they want me to say, I say. If they just want to touch my, my, my clothes, let them touch my clothes. It's not important. I can handle that. I understand their weakness and weak understanding uh, of me, God, and, 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 and spiritual things maybe. But, you know, I'll do what they want, you know, as long as they have faith. And that's, that's the fourth thing we, we learn about Jesus Christ is that um, he is looking for faith. He is looking for faith. That's the, that's the main thing when he comes to this earth uh, and he wants to see something in people. It's not the riches. It's not the great architect, architecture. It's not, you know, the achievements, scientific achievements. Uh, it's not whatever people can do. He is looking for faith. Do you have faith or not? And remember, you know, there's a saying in this, in, in this world, especially among the Christians, I mean, is that uh, you can't surprise God. A lot, of people, a lot of times, you know, people say, well, you can't surprise God. Well, I guess you can. You, know, you look at the Bible and life of Christ on this earth, he was surprised a lot. But <laughs> he was surprised only two things. Number one, he was surprised about people who should have faith and don't have it namely Jews. And number two, he was surprised of people who shouldn't have faith, Gentiles, but they do have faith. He was amazed, like, even in, in Israel I couldn't find faith like this. So Christ is looking for faith. He is looking for faith. He is um, valuing faith, faith. He is protecting faith, we can see in, in the story of Jairus. He encourages faith. He defends the faith. That's, that's his ministry. And I think uh, this uh, behavior, this attitude of Christ is continuing in our day. Faith is the most precious thing for him in people. Not our wealth, not our achievement, not our ministry, not the size of the church or, or the size of the band. I mean, whatever we can come up with. It doesn't impress him. The only thing that will really impress him is faith. That's what he's looking for. And one big concern and regret that he will, will have in the future when he comes on the earth. Remember when he says, when I come to the, earth, to the earth, will I find faith? That's the only thing he is looking for. He is looking for faith. And the question is, do we have it? Do we have it? And to the believers, I say, praise God. I praise God that we have it because we have it because He is protecting our faith. He is encouraging our faith. He is defending our faith. If not for Him and His word, do not be afraid, only believe. These doubts that surround us would destroy our faith. But Christ Himself, He is holding our faith intact by the word of God today, by the Holy Spirit that dwells in us, but He is holding this faith intact. And praise God for that. Praise Jesus Christ for that. In the conclusion, in the conclusion, I want to point out to two moments in this story. At the very end, at the very end of this story, Mark 5, 38. They came to the house of synagogue official and he saw a commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing. Commotion, weeping and wailing. Commotion, basically, disorder, chaos, and weeping and wailing. That's the life of person without Jesus Christ. How does your life look today? If there is no Christ in your life, 
I can guarantee that you have these three things. You have a commotion, chaos, you have weeping, and you have wailing. It is guaranteed. Without Christ, there is no future, there is no life, there is no joy, even on this earth. Not only in eternity, even on this earth. And number two uh, point I want to make is Mark 5.41. How does Christ deal with this commotion, weeping and wailing? Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Little girl, I say to you, get up. Jesus Christ is the same today. He is the same today. No, he is not talking in linen clothing, and in sandals, you know, um, you know, on the streets of Spokane, waiting for somebody to grab him for his, you know, uh, clothing. He is here today in, in Holy Spirit. He is here today in his scripture. And he is offering his hand. If you have a commotion in your life, if you have weeping, if you, if you have wailing in your life, there is a stretched out hand of Jesus Christ to you right now. If you allow him to touch your life, to touch your heart, you will rise from dead. Your spirit, which is dead with Christ, will become alive. And you will find this unity with God through Jesus Christ. This offer stands today, right now, and until his coming. And it's your decision to take it and receive him as his savior. Let's pray and praise God. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your mercy and kindness that you show us in this day, for example, that you kept us safe in our houses through the night that you gave us strength and health and opportunity to come to this place, to sing to you, to worship you, to listen to your word, to have a fellowship in your spirit as the believers. We're very grateful for that. We're grateful that you are our savior, that you found each one of us, that you gave us life, that you rose us from the dead and give us eternal life, hope and future in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that you would uh, help us to entrust our lives in you, entrust our faith to you. You're the only one who is object of our faith, and we pray that you would keep our faith strong in these last days. In the days where this faith of Christians is targeted by a godless world, and I pray that you would help us to withstand any attacks that we can receive in our life. Help us be strong in your spirit. Help us to be victorious in our faith. I also pray that you would give us the strength to proclaim our faith, not to hide it. To be witnesses of the gospel in the places where we work, where we rest, where we live. So we would be a light and salt to this world. So we wouldn't hide this miracle that you made in us. Help us, Lord. I also pray for those who don't have you as a personal Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you would touch their hearts and break this barrier and help them to see the predicament that they are in. Help them to see the commotion in their life, weeping and wailing, and plant that desire to find peace in you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Once again, we pray that you would bless the rest of this day, especially the beginning and the duration of a kid's camp. This smoke, this fire, there is nothing we can do about it. I only pray to you that you would clear up the sky and uh, bless this camp so many kids would be blessed by the, swor by the word that will, will be spoken there, by the fellowship. And many would come to knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We pray it in Jesus' name, with all your glory, our Heavenly Father. Amen. God bless you guys. You have a great day, good week. Greet your friends. Greet the guests. <laughs>